Well, hello there and welcome. My name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director at the Centre for Independent Studies and it's great to have you here for our first real event of 2022. Welcome uh, to the Royal Automobile Club. Much appreciated to be here for this special event on Indigenous affairs in our nation. The problems plaguing our remote Indigenous communities are nothing new. Uh, we've all heard about the very high rates of alcohol abuse, crime, domestic abuse, languishing education, employment levels, and of course, intergenerational welfare dependency. As a result, there is an alarming and growing gap between remote Indigenous people and the rest of Australia, including Aboriginal Australians in city areas. However, with Australia Day tomorrow, discussions inevitably lead to rehash statements around symbolic gestures and postures rather than effective strategies and policy for improving the lives of our Indigenous population. In 2022, as the next federal election looms, as of course the COVID crisis continues, and of course we face threats from China, will Indigenous affairs be forgotten in an election year? Will we come any closer to closing the gap? Why has the vaccine uptake amongst Indigenous Australians been far lower than the rest of the population? Is the government misallocating resources when it comes to Indigenous health? Would a Labor government under a Prime Minister Anthony Albanese bring about change and progress or represent just empty symbolic gestures? Are remote Indigenous communities being overlooked in recent federal education and criminal justice policies? And finally, what to make of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a voice to Parliament? Well, we've got a terrific panel to address these issues here today. Stan Grant is one of our nation's most distinguished journalists and authors. He's published at least six books and two quarterly essays just in the course of the last five years. He's a regular panellist and contributor and host of many prominent programs around the world, including uh, Sky News, uh, CNN, Al Jazeera, and of course, most recently, the ABC. His latest book, With the Falling of the Dusk, is published by Harper Columns. Please welcome Stan Grant. And Warren Mundine, uh, no stranger to CIS, uh, is a media commentator, author, businessman, former Deputy Mayor of Dubbo, National President of the ALP, and Chair of the Abbott and Turnbull Government's Advisory Council for Indigenous Affairs. And of course, most importantly, from our perspective, um, as of uh, mid to late last year, when our friend and colleague Jacinta Price was pre-selected for the country Liberal Party in the Northern Territory, which means she's more than likely going to be a senator after the next federal election, Warren has been the Indigenous Forum Director here at the Centre for Independent Studies. Please welcome Warren. <laughs> Stan, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Um, can I pay my respects as well to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation? Um, we're gathering here on their lands today. Uh, in fact, not far from here, um, just at the uh, at uh, Circular Quay, back in the 1850s, early 1860s, the Aboriginal people who were the remnants of the survivors um, here were all living around the, the boat sheds, the old boat sheds. Um, one of them, a young boy at the time, is my great, great grandfather. So I feel a very strong personal <laughs> connection um, to this area as well. It's lovely to have all of you here today for this discussion. Warren, I was just thinking, and we're sitting there, you know, having our lunch and about to come up, and you and I, we've known each other for such a long time. Warren and I were at university together, you know, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so, so last century. He, was, he yeah. was older than me then, and he's still older than me. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, considering that journey, that, that, that journey intellectually, politically, you look back at how we were then, 
full of that sort of youth and, and, and you know, outrage and umbrage at everything. Mm. What about your journey from the Warren of the 1980s to the Warren of today? Well, I'm always, especially when I, I see you, uh, Stan, I'm always remembered when we first met and I turned up and I uh, had the Aboriginal that's colours right. on my head, you know, the T-shirt, you know, <laughs> the, the Aboriginal flag on it and that. And, uh, and I think I had my um, duffel bag had the Aboriginal flag on it as well. And I was a, a very young, good-looking, uh, radical that's right. <laughs> type guy. And, and it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite... It's, it's quite funny to look at that. I've seen some photos and I had a bit of an afro there. That's right. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and, a, and a very fetching moustache yeah, as well. Yeah, very, yeah, look, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what can I say about the moustache, yeah, you know. But it was, um, and I look about the journey that from then, you know, to now and how I, I looked at things. And, uh, and really the, I think I hadn't really changed that much. Mm. Uh, in my thinking and what I uh, wanted to achieve, it was really about how you do these things. How do you get these uh, things uh, to happen? And, uh, and I, I just thought it was a bit of a, a waste of time after a while about, you know, you can get out in the street and demonstrate and everything like that. And, uh, in fact, that's how I met one of my wives. Really. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was... Um, uh, to actually, how do you how do you get things to happen, and how, and what about the real focus? Because I was always interested in, uh, and I'm a great believer in, uh, if you're going to make p changes in people's lives, then you really got to come from an uh, economic hmm. uh, economic development approach. About you know, you don't lift people out of poverty unless you can get them a job and uh, get some businesses and things happening. So it was very basic thoughts like that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the, the Warren of then and, and myself at that time, we have more than likely tomorrow have been out on the streets protesting. Yes. Um, yeah. but, but as you say, there, there is that moment. There is, you know, protest has its, its place. But in terms of getting things done, when did you say, you know, Tom talked about the difference between symbolism yeah. and action. When did that start to sharpen in your mind? Well, and of course, well, you know, when you're at university and you're studying and you're looking at a whole wide range of uh, writings and that, I, I, I sort of went on this interesting journey. I looked, I, I, I took a, a viewpoint of what you've been in, a, you're in a society, it's been invaded, the whole society's collapsed. In, a, in, a, in so many different ways, how do you how do you rebuild that society? So I actually went, you know, a lot of people go to the Canada or the United States and and, and New Zealand and look at the indigenous populations and that I did part of that, but I was very interested in like South Korea, for instance. It was mm. after the, the Korean War. It was. Uh, you know, people are eating grass and, and starving. North, North Korea's economy was yeah. more powerful yeah. and more successful in than those South. days. Yes, it was. And then you get 15 years later, it becomes this economic power. Uh, so I was fascinated how they did that. I was, uh, even looked at Ataturk in Turkey when mm. uh, you go to the, you know, trying to make a modern society. And sure, there were certain things we wouldn't do, but I was interested in how they did that. Uh, you know, like taking the Arab script. And within five years, I was writing in the Latin script. Mm -hmm. and so I think so. So I was and interested in creating a secular society. Yeah, so, and then, of course, at the moment, I'm reading with um, Lee Kuan Yew and that. So I, I went on this different journey, you know, and of course, Milton Friedman and, mm. and a few other people, and looking at how how you make these differences. And that's what focused on me. So I was, I don't mind symbolics because my background is my. Uh, I was talking earlier about my great grandfather was Irish and that, so we were very Catholic, and symbolism is very important in that religion. Mm -hmm. But I was more about practical stuff. It's about okay, how do we get that person that job, mm. and what are the things that uh, that we need to do in communities to get economic development to happen? It's interesting because that that reflects our backgrounds, doesn't it? I mean, you know, Warren and I come from very similar backgrounds. New South Wales, Aboriginal communities, 
both yeah. Irish and Aboriginal, Shamrock Aborigines as they call us. <laughs> um, you know, we yeah. come off the missions. Faith was important. Mm. We came out of the churches on the missions. Right. Our families worked in the rural industries. They picked fruit. They, they worked on the, on the railroads. They worked in the sawmills. Um, our journey has been a journey of economic migration, hasn't it? Yeah, well, that's exactly uh, – that's what I call myself living in Sydney. I'm an economic, uh, you know, refugee because my family come to Sydney looking for a better life mm. and looking, uh, at, uh, you know, having it, been able to afford a house and doing uh, getting jobs and everything like that. It's really interesting because even though we come from very similar backgrounds and very poor, the, sort of like the Irish poor and the Aboriginal poor backgrounds, uh, it was uh, our people worked. And that's what they were. I found fascinating. They didn't do get great wages or they, uh, uh, they worked very hard. You know, they worked on cattle stations, they worked on sheep stations. Uh, they uh, did uh, cotton chipping and, and, and asparagus and stuff like that. Uh, but they always worked. And that was a, a thing that was very much set in my mind. Uh, and it was not because they told us. That it was, and and work, it was observation. Work, work was a measure of, of pride too, yes, wasn't it? It, right. was, it wasn't mm. that I'm working and I'm being cheated at not getting full pay or whatever. It was... Mm. This is what you do to look after your family. It yeah, was a measure right. of your pride. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it, and, it, and it did come from a very cultural background because, I, I, you know, my grandfather and that they used to say, "You, you bring something to the campfire." Hmm. Or you have to bring something to the campfire. You know, you can't have someone bludging within a in, within the community and not pulling their own weight. Now, it could be ceremony, it could be food, it could be a wide range of things, but they had to bring something there. And, and so no matter what and, and, and no matter what they, uh, you know, what jobs they were doing, like, you know, you know my father was pretty funny. He had this little saying, you know, he'd go, I'd say, so what do you think of uh, Stan Grant? And he'd say, and he'd, he'd have one or another answer. He'd say, he's a worker. Mm. Or he's not a worker, and it had all these connotations about it. You know, mm. he's a worker. He goes out, and you know, may be earning not very good money, but he's feeding his kids, his family, he's clothing them. He's he's, he's got a roof over their head and stuff like that. And and it's interesting, Warren, because this goes to a really fundamental divide, um, and it has helped to influence policy uh, in Australia. Um, the idea of self sufficiency of engagement in the market economy, of change, of the ability to adapt to change, or one of seeing Aboriginal people as something to be protected, um, something to be shielded away from the rest of society. Um, there was this line from William Stanner, the anthropologist famous for the Boyer lectures, and who once said that the market and the dreaming are mutually exclusive. I could think of nothing less true than that, than our experience. But that that divide exists, doesn't it, between those who see this story is in its worst or crudest form as an assimilationist story, yeah. that you're becoming white, yeah. or those and those who see a, an idea of a pristine Aboriginal existence that sits outside the market, sits outside modernity, sits outside society and needs to somehow be... Protected. They are very strong undercurrents in how policy has been shaped, isn't it? That's <coughs> excuse me. That's correct. Uh, you, you, uh, some some of them, some people in the in their worst uh, wants to keep us almost like museum pieces mm. of this. And in, in and it's really funny because when you do go into traditional, you know, called traditional Aboriginal societies, like uh, I have a story about Jambawa. Uh, Ma Willie, who was the clan leader out of uh, Beniala up in Blue Mud Bay in northeast Arnhem Land. And we were in Canberra uh, uh, doing some stuff, I think it was lobbying for something, and uh, and we was in the, the hotel that night and we are drinking and he was singing and he was singing in his traditional language. And and I, I suddenly realised, I said, I know these songs. And, I, and I, so I said to him, I said, I know these songs. And, and he said, yes, they're Christian songs. So he, even though he was a fully initiated sing hymns. clan leader, he was singing hymns and he saw himself as a Christian. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. that's something we overlook as well, is mm. Christianity and the role of Christianity mm. 
in our societies. You have pastors in your family, I have yeah, pastors yeah. In, in my family. And it gave that sense of hierarchy, that sense of responsibility, that glue that held the communities together was very much rooted in that. And that that was at the heart of the beginnings of the Aboriginal social justice and political rights movement too, wasn't well, it? Well, when you look at all the people who were working, you know, William Cooper and everything like that, uh, the thing Doug Nichols. Yep, yep, Doug Nichols. They were, they were pastors. They were, it, it's almost like in the United States where you've got, you know, uh, Martin Luther King and all these pastors mm. and that as well. That they had a very strong um, view about uh, civil rights uh, being part of the society that you, you're in and that you were able to have enjoy opportunities that the rest of the society had to offer. And, that, and there's great speeches, like I, I've read Bill Ferguson at the mm. 1942. Who was a, a shearer, worked yeah, in a shearer. Yeah, shearer. He started out as a shearer and he worked as a mailman and stuff like that. And uh, and he gave that speech about uh, at the uh, New South Wales Labor Conference, it was, and he, about citizenship and being... Uh, being able to, uh, you know, participate in the, in in the Australian dream, really, mm. uh, and and there's one thing I I, uh, I got to say about a lot of that stuff is that uh, Australia's, um, of course, every country in the world's had a, had its rough beginnings and a tough beginnings, and there's some horrible things that did happen and everything, people driven off the land and that. We're sort of survivors of it. Like we, we, we knew that there either you stayed on the reserves or you had to get off to mm. improve your life. And our parents and grandparents moved off to get that to happen. And it was so. Um, and, and it was. So, and this is also the divide between people and 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 that as well. So I'm a, a great believer that one thing that we were fortunate about was the institutions that were in Australia. So you had the Westminster parliamentary system, you had the, the rule of law and the court systems and even judges, I don't know if there's any judges in the room, but they all think they're God. But they, um, but even they admit sometimes they make mistakes and that's why we have an appeal system to uh, correct those mistakes and, mm. and, and move things on. And so, so you look at our history and it, and and you and you can see how from like the like forties, late thirties, forties onward, the changes and how those institutions helped us to make those changes. Mm. And and we're a we're a product of that. Yes, I mean, you we're know, a product you, of it. We our, our old, my older brothers and sisters and, and parents and that was involved in the six seven referendum. They they and even the simple thing of actually moving off the reserve, getting a job. And then buying a house in town, it was really made a big difference for those for those children that come out of that because they they saw something which to me was very natural. So I always talk about my grandfather got a job on a cattle station. It was a pretty rough job, but he used to get up in the morning, go to work, get paid, come home, and give his money to my grandmother mm. who clothed, clothed us and fed us and that. Then my father grew up thinking that was normal. So he did the same thing. He went to work, he'd get it paid, come home and give his money to mum and then she'd clove us, feed us and, and we grew up thinking that was normal. So when I got a job, I'd go out, get paid and then I'd come home and mm. give some of the money to my wife and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had uh, – and that was normal. So my kids, they, they have no idea of not working Mm. or not being educated. It's interesting, you know, you talk mm. about the institutions and the way society mm. changes and that mm. engine of change. I think about my life and there were two um, instruments of policy that mm. made a fundamental difference and both of them related to deeper engagement with the marketplace and mm. deeper engagement with society mm. more broadly. One was a program introduced in the 1970s for Aboriginal families to buy a home mm. um, with low mortgage, if you could show you had a history of work, you could, you could get a low interest home loan. It was the first time in my life that we actually had a home and the certainty of a home. The other thing was a program that gave, put money directly into the hands of Aboriginal families to buy textbooks, school books, uniforms, um, pay for the incidental costs of education, that you could allow you 
families could have the wherewithal to allow their kids mm. to stay and stay in school. Remember the three dollar checks we got every. I was just going to say that we're probably going to show our age the, the, by the saying three dollar check. <laughs> we each, our Aboriginal <laughs> kids got a three dollar check every fortnight, <laughs> which 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 meant that we could go for a swim in the swimming pool. We could buy some loll- lollies at the mm. tuck shop, and mm. the things that other people take for granted that sweeten life and get you through. Those things were really critical. Now, some families, as families are want to do, maybe mm. didn't utilise it in the right way. Mm. Those that did were the product of well, that. They prospered, but yeah. And they right. prospered. And, and, mm. and so it goes to this idea, Warren, about how much of government do we need in our life and where does government end and where does the question of responsibility begin? Well, I think we're probably one of the... Uh, right, one of the few races in the world that needs to get government offers. <laughs> yeah, we've had 200 years of government control, yeah. working on the going back to the old re- reserves and missions and how they controlled us. They, they've, and up until 1969 when they finally got rid of the uh, Aboriginal Protections Acts around Australia and that, uh, we, we were totally controlled by government. So it's not surprising. In fact, I, my sister and I have a little joke about it. Uh, it's not surprising that we always look to government mm. to fix things. Mm. Um, in fact, I, I wish to sit, talk about some of our more radical mates and that who want to drive all you people into the oceans <laughs> and, and reset up uh, Aboriginal land. And, and, that, and that we, we imagine them sitting around a fire talking about it. Then they'd say, okay, where did we get the government grant to buy the guns? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it, 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 it is that idea that yeah. the government, and, and yet that's not where we came from. It wasn't no, what our grandparents were talking about, yeah. was it? It was, yeah. it was self sufficiency. So yeah. it's it's striking that balance. I mean, those couple of policy changes were enormously significant in my family. It was like enough government to give you a break, and not enough government to get in your way. That's right, and we, and and that's what you know, we, and that's how we were brought up. We always wanted uh, from my family and, and extended family was uh, get government out of our face. Mm. We wanted the freedom to do what we wanted to do. Now I remember my father, 1947. You know, he come back after the war. He wanted to buy a home, and then he realised that he was only get. Well, they called it the Aboriginal allowance in those days. He's only getting that, so he was driving a grader. Uh, so the a non-Aboriginal guy next to him was giving him a lot more money than him. And so he took up that fight about um, getting the full wage and he got the full wage in 1947 and they brought a house. And that's what they just wanted. They just wanted to buy a house. And that house, I I look back at it, it was fun. It was was a four-room house. It had the boys' room. No, we slept in the veranda actually. We slept in the veranda. They had a girls' room. They had the kitchen and the parents, and they had the outhouse, the bath, and they out was outside. And but that sort of, you know, the, the strength of my parents to get that full wage, and that sort of flowed onto us that we had a place to go to, which mm. was ours. You know, I remember once when I was, I would have been seven, six or seven, the welfare officer, the Aboriginal Protection Board, come mm. along, and my mother bashed him with a broom and drove him out of the house, which is quite funny because he's four foot 11 and I suppose it was the Irish and Aboriginal blood, that's what did it. And because she said, this is my house, this is not an Aboriginal protection board or welfare board house. Mm-hmm. And so that gave, that gave them a lot of strength. They did other things like, um, uh, because my mum was such a, uh, you know, good Donovans they were, they're very mm-hmm. Irish Catholic. And she... Um, uh, she went to the – there's only a Catholic uh, primary school for boys, but St Mary's um, College, you've probably heard of St Mary's College in Grafton, some of you. Uh, that was for girls. That was the high school. And they actually went down and, and convinced the nuns and uh, the local bishop that, that they should make it co-ed. Mm. Much to the delight of my older brothers who had a lot of fun while they were there. <laughs> but, yeah, so, so that's how – from that struggles and fights, mm. they had all this strength. You've, you were talking before about the influence of seeing other countries and how they've transformed yeah. and how countries that have suffered um, invasion themselves, colonisation, conflict, rebuild themselves. One of the people that you've been influenced by is Booker T. Washington yes. in, in the US, yeah. someone who talked about again for African Americans, the need for economic uplift, self-sufficiency to get an economic base. 
Tell us first of all about the influence that he's had on you and then I want to ask about how he is seen often by people in America. Yeah, that was interesting because uh, it's funny how things come about. My older brother, of course, there's 11 kids in the family, so he's 20 years older than me. He went. He was a regular army, he wasn't a conscript, and he uh, went f- three times to Vietnam. And he, uh, and of course, he was mixing with the African-American soldiers and American soldiers, and he used to bring ebony magazines, mm-hmm. send us mm-hmm. back these ebony magazines that was. And so we, as young kids, I was like a little sponge. We used to uh, soak up all this stuff because th- this ebony magazine, the black people in the magazine. They, they were, were successful. They, they, they were flash. <laughs> they were really flash and, and, uh, and educated and, and the universities had these uh, uh, what they call it. Um, uh, African American historical universities. They had all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I was interested in this stuff, uh, and so I started reading about a, a lot of these um, of these African American scholars. And that. so we had Booker T. Washington and and W. E. Du Bois, and then Marcus Garvey and mm-hmm. people like that. And I was looking at how all they of them did. very different in their approach. Totally different. Yeah. Totally different. Uh, w. E. Du Bois ended up being uh, uh, well. He was a very strong socialist and a um, you know, quite uh, communist, and he went back to uh, Ghana, mm. and and Marcus Garvey was back to Africa, back to Africa movement. You know, but one thing I found interesting about him, except more, especially Garvey and Booker T, was that they had this economic development model. Mm. And so, in fact, it was funny. Uh, uh, Marcus Garvey uh, decided to set up this shipping line, which he called Black Star, because he had White Star Line, which was the Titanic, and uh, <laughs> and and he set up this this business, and it had, and it was this interesting movie movement. But they just wanted to go back to Africa. Booker T. Uh, Washington was out of the three of them. He was the only one that was actually a slave. He was born a slave um, uh, in uh, Virginia, and uh, he never knew who his father was. Um, his, uh, there was a, he talks about a little bit of a rumor that probably he was a the master mm. on another far, uh, a, a plantation down the road, but he grew up as a slave, and and, and, it's, and, he had, and it's really interesting that, that this here about because he's never taught the read and write, but he, one of the jobs he had as a young boy was to take the master's daughters to school, and so he used to sit outside the school and he'd and he'd see these people with these books, and I didn't know, and they were sitting there going like this, and it fascinated him. And he was, and that's when he got this, I want to know what these books are, I want to read, I want to know how to write. And it wasn't until many years later that he got that opportunity to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, he went on and set up the Tuskegee um, uh, University, mm-hmm. and which is pretty famous. With people hear about the Tuskegee Airmen during the Second World War, who were, and, uh, and also the university still operating today, and it's a... And it's interesting, Warren, isn't it? Because um, if you if you look at Booker T. Washington and that idea of an economic base and uplift, it's often cast these days by some in really disparaging terms, most like an Uncle Tom or a well, or an assimilationist yes, approach. And a similar thing here mm-hmm. has taken root that the idea that that sort of success or entrepreneurship or capitalism or market engagement and economic base is seen as somehow assimilationist. When did that start to take hold? This is not what our yes. grandparents grew up with. No, they but were Why very does this prevail today? Yes. Uh, that, I find that interesting because you're right, it was our grandparents and when I was writing my book I learned about my great-grandparents and that as well. They were very independent, very uh, you know, getting away from government uh, in fact, in, in, I actually write about in my book, my grandf- uh, the police and the um, welfare officers turned up at, at, Bi- at Bayougal where we were, which was a cattle station, so it was, wasn't a reserve. And, uh, and they were going to go in and check out the Aboriginals just to make sure they were clean and looked up. And, uh, and my grandfather pulled a gun on them and, and, and they, uh, they, they ran away very quickly. And then they went, o- and they w- went back to casino to get the get other police and that to come back, but the cattle station owner, who at the time was um, uh, Anf- a son of Anthony Horden, the big mm, department mm. store people, and he actually rang the police up and and 
and said, leave these Aboriginals alone. These are good Aboriginals and that. And so this is, we had this independent spirit and religion, but it was really funny because you sort of look at the 60s, the late 60s and 70s, then things, these things started changing. Mm. And you get movements like the black, a lot of people, I don't know if in the room, know there was a Black Panther, Panther movement yeah. in, in Australia. And in fact, uh, Rachel Perkins did a doco on it, Black Panther Woman. And so in, in the, then you had this, uh, this shift about, you know, looking to governments and, and, and governments uh, uh, providing all our income and everything. And then, of course, two things happened. Then was the, um, uh, the equal pay court case, which had to happen. We had to get equal pay. They Finally, that happened. But it hit the same time that we were able to ax, access welfare. And this is where the elders within the Aboriginal community, they're the ones who come up with this thing of sit-down money. Mm. You hear that word. They could not, these, these were tough, wiry old people who were shearers and roustabouts and, and cattlemen and drovers and stuff. And they could not believe that when the government told them, said, oh, look, if you lose your job, we will give you money. And they, they said, what, if we don't work, you're going to give us money. And they said, yes. So if we just sit down here and do nothing, you're going to give us <laughs> money. And they could not understand that. And they said, so you're going to give us sit-down money, huh? mm-hmm. and that was. And I thought it was a great line, you know, you're going to give us sit-down money and get nothing, and just to do nothing. And Noel Pearson talks about it too, the poison of, of, of welfare. And it did... And they actually said, the elders then said, that, that this will be a destruction of our society. Which is weird because it's it's taking place at the same time that you have a much more strident, um, even militant, you talk about the Black yeah. Panthers, yeah. political expression, which yeah. is saying we reject all of this. Yeah. On the one hand, you're saying, can we get money to sit down and do nothing? On the other hand, you're saying we reject all of this government, we reject Western society, we reject these things. It's it's a it's a strange contradiction, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is. It's it, it's actually really weird. Sort of like like my earlier comment about we're going to have the revolution drive you all in the sea, but we're going to get government grants to buy the guns. It it, it had this sort of weird thing that, and then also the, the, uh, the, the, there was this. We become captive of government. We started looking for people. Even myself in the early days, we we'd go, we say, oh, we want to do something. Okay, where, where do we get a – what department do we need to go to to get mm-hmm. that support and do mm-hmm. things and that? Um, it's uh, And, and it, it really, really has uh, held us back. And they've got weird things like uh, like uh, if when I started my own business probably back in late 80s, um, they um, – I said, why are you doing white men's business? You know, what are you doing white men's thing for? And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. Uh, when did business become white men's business? Well, when business? it was going to be white men, the Chinese do it, the, <laughs> the South Koreans do it, the, you know, the Africans do it. Everyone does this. This is not a white man game. Yeah, yes, white men do it and they do it very successful and we, other people, the Japanese do it. And that. Mm. So but this is this idea that's got in that everything – uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to uh, be an entrepreneur, trying to get, uh, break out of the poverty side or try to do things, all of a sudden become this white man's game. And, I, and, and it was, and it become very vitriolic, especially in the last 15 years. Yeah. Where, uh, where they try and drag you down, which they try, did with yeah. uh, Booker T. Washington, where yeah. they, they said, oh, you're, you know, you're getting this. I'll go back to him in a sec now. Apathy is the word they use. Yeah, he was an interesting guy because I hope there's no French professors in the room, but he thought that was a waste of time. He said you should be doing a trade or doing, uh, you know, teaching um, uh, engineering, a doctor. I I think he made a mistake here. He said a lawyer. I hope no lawyers (laughs) in the room too. But But he was more interested in those practical stuff and uh, and he looked upon, you know, things like, being a French teacher or something, it was a bit weird. That di- that did not give pr- pr- mm. the productivity and, and growth for your community. And and what I think after reading a lot about him, that come from was because he was a slave, mm. and he he knew what it was like. Yeah. I want to go to questions in about ten minutes or so. There's a few more things I want to explore with Warren. Um, you yeah. talked about history, and history is the big, yeah. what one of the big issues confronting us. We'll just save that for a moment. But I want to ask you this, Warren. Um, and it's a question I get asked a lot and, and people will often look at 
the likes of you and I and say, oh, but, but you're different or <laughs> you're not like the others or um, – yeah. and my answer is, well, you know, do, do you know them all? Do you know them? But, but yeah. why is it that, you know, you and I who have come from dirt poor – Mm. Menial labouring backgrounds, Aboriginal families, missions, exclusion, segregation, discrimination, all of those things uh, are sitting here today and having this conversation. Other members of our family, mm. not, um, and and still struggling and we can go to the graveyards yeah. from the towns that we're from and sadly see too many of our people dying young. Why do we continue to see, while we're seeing more Aboriginal university graduates than ever before, mm. We have more Indigenous people in our parliaments than ever before. We have more Indigenous businesses than ever before. Are we still seeing this stubborn resistance when it comes to overall closing the gap? What, what, why do we see the remote communities that Tom had talked about in the introduction today continuing to deal with conditions that would shame developed parts of the developing world? How do you explain this dissonance between the success and the emergence of an Aboriginal middle class on the one hand and the stubborn, ongoing, deep-rooted disadvantage that communities still still suffer. It's, it, and some of those communities should not be disadvantaged as well. I, I, look, you know, as, I, you know, as people know, I work in the mining industry and energy industry and um, you get uh, uh, – working on Aboriginal land, you have these amazing – uh, things that happen because they get royalties and they get uh, and this is one thing I'd like to see checking on this because I've been to communities where people are living in abject poverty and yet there's a mine on that property and and it, it has some of these uh, trusts they set them all up as trust have hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in them and yet the people who who own that uh, are still living in poverty and that's I just I just can't understand how that is a lot of it is because we we were treated like uh, you know, special, like we're, we're special. So we couldn't be trusted to have the couple hundred million dollars coming out of the mining industry and that had to be put in a charitable trust and all that type of stuff. There, there's one of the, the – and it's, and it's and there's a, in these big organisations, um, which I uh, – like the land councils, uh, you look at them, and they, you know, I can understand the early days when they were first set up because we, you know, had to make sure things were, you know, right. But now they've become big gatekeepers. And I look at people, the Aboriginal community people on the ground, and they're very smart. They know how to do things. They want to do things. Uh, you know, you see them moving and shaking and doing stuff. But because of the structures that are there, you know, property rights and so on, uh, it is uh, stopping communities from moving ahead mm -hmm. and it is really uh, and and then now we've got into this thing about this race issue of uh you know this is white man's game this is this game and people yeah. like i had an argument uh, this this is where i'm probably stupid i did an argument on twitter once with this person this uh, this a black person who said uh who was arguing that i'm because of my skin color and that i'm i'm, I'm oppressed and, and people who are white are the oppressors. And, and I said, I, I don't, I'm not oppressed. I said, and then and, and it went for this backwards and forwards and eventually he said, one day, Warren, you will wake up and look in the mirror and you will see that you are an oppressed person. And I'm thinking, where does this come from? Hmm. My, my parents never thought themselves it's, as oppressed. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea mm -hmm. and... You know, a, an identity is formed around a suffering or even yeah. a vicarious suffering, um, not one that's necessarily reflected even of personal experience but historical experience. Yeah. So I want to ask you about history. How I mean, tomorrow will be a, a celebration of a day that mm. also, you've used the word invasion, mm. marks mm. the complete change for us um, with the arrival oh, of the yeah. First Fleet. Um how do you reconcile the weight of that history? It's, it's, uh, it's not easy to live with. We've experienced and our families have experienced the worst of it. Yeah. And yet we also live in a country where you and I today are here having this conversation in this room and, and by many measures are considered successful in this country. So how do you live with the weight of that history? 
Uh, look, I don't, the way the history doesn't weigh me down. Uh, uh, history is is what it is. It's just there. Uh, the good, the bad, you know. And I talked about my Irish ancestry in that as well, which probably means I got. Mm. Uh, Viking blood, which probably means I was a raper and pillager and, and murdering people. Across well, I, I, I often <laughs> say, you know, on Australia Day, um, mm-hmm. am I meant to be at war with myself because I'm mm. descended of Aboriginal people and Irish yeah, convicts punch, and coloniser and colonised? It's a strange way yeah. to be. But what you, what I think people get it wrong is that they take that as drag history dragging you down. History is what you lo- I, like. I use history a lot uh, to learn from about. Uh, how how do you overcome things? Mm. How do you improve people's lives? You know, and of course the you know human rights and the things only been around for a couple hundred years and stuff. Mm. So it's very it's a little blimp in the history of humanity. So and democracy, you know, it is. So it's very important for us to preserve and and look after those things because when you look at it, uh, you look at um, in Australia. 1962, Menzies gave us the full voting rights. Uh, at the uh, 67 referendum made the changes. Within four years, we've had um, uh, Neville Bonner in, mm. in, in the uh, Senate, and and we Aboriginal and, Affairs and, Department uh, uh, was set up. All the, the, the funding of helping people get businesses and jobs and things. So we had and that was done because of the the institutions we had. We were lucky by the institutions of those who who saw that they had to have change, they have to make a difference. And now, as you said, we've got more Aboriginals in parliaments across Australia than we have ever had in the history, and a lot more is going to come as we move along. In fact, we had a chief minister in, in the Northern Territory. And, that, so we, and, and Ben White, who I consider one of the best treasurers in, mm. in Australia, and he was the Western Australian treasurer. And you, it's, it's about don't... It's not a burden, you know. You can't, you know, you, 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 probably in a couple hundred years ago, both our families were probably fighting each mm. other mm. and doing things. That's just, that's just factual. That's just history. What do we learn from that mm. and how do we move forward? Because you can't be fighting the old fights all over again. It almost sounds like you're in the Balkans. I'm, I, I remember. Well, well it's, 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 it's interesting you, you mentioned the Balkans. I mean, yeah. the, the yeah. conflicts that I've covered as a journalist, whether it be the Balkans, whether it be in the Middle East, whether it be Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah. um, they're rooted in some sense of identity and historical grievance. Yes. And so much of the world is framed around a sense of historical grievance. Xi Jinping mm. talks about the, the hundred years of humiliation. Mm. Vladimir Putin talks about the fall of the Soviet Empire as the, the great political catastrophe of the 20th mm. century. He's still talking about Catherine the Great. Um, we know the Islamic world and Islamist militancy is still in so many ways fighting the mm. Crusades. Mm. And here in Australia as well, the idea of an Aboriginal identity is forged around some form of grievance, resentment, trauma that comes from history. Mm. And it's a very seductive and powerful oh, narrative, it is, isn't it? It is. And it's, 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 as you just pointed out, it's an, uh, and my saying is not an Aboriginal thing. It's like, you know, when, when Mat, Mat, Matic, the uh, Serbian general, mm, mm. Yeah, he was they'd going through the peace agreement and, uh, and he's talking about these people over there that have come and raped my village and killed us and stuff. So, and and Holly, uh, what's his name? Um, Hollingwoods. He said, um, he said, my, that's terrible. It's terrible. He said, can take me to your village and show it to me. And so he took him to the village and it's a nice village. And he said, when did this happen? And he said, oh, back in 1546 <laughs> or something like that. You, mm. and, 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 yes, and we know history has taught us if you, if you work off that grievance, it's a dead end street. Mm. All you're going to do is just be throwing bombs at each other forever and ever in a day. And I always say to a lot of my mates as well, is that, look, there's 25, 26 million other people in this country. What are you going to do with them? Mm. Put them on a boat and send them home? Uh, we're building a, a very great, and I say we because Aboriginals are playing a role yeah. in this, we're building a, a really great nation. So we've got Indigenous people, we've got the, the colonisers who come here, we've got the immigrants who come here and that, especially the ones after the Second World War, the millions of them who come here and put their shoulder to the, to the grind and really help build this economy here. And 
And I reckon we're one of the most successful uh, multicultural countries in the world. Is it perfect? There's no way it's perfect. Do we have races? Yes, we do have races. But every other country in the world has... So let's not bl you know, blow it up <laughs> and make it huge. Yes, it, we, can, we know how to deal with races and that now because we've got, we've got legislation, we've got a whole wide range of things. We need to keep on talking and, 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 and working about how we can make this country even better. Uh, hanging on to the... Yes, never forget history. Talk about it. We've got to have it in our classrooms. People have got to learn about it because I'm a great believer if you don't learn about history, then you always repeat it. Mm. Um, mm. Before we go to questions, I want to just talk about the Uluru Statement from the heart because mm. it brings together so much of what you're talking about here. Um, it's the latest iteration of a political... Mm journey for recognition and rights, which has been going on for two centuries. Mm. Um, it talks about truth-telling, which yeah. your, goes to your point of history. It talks about a voice in the constitution that embeds Aboriginal aspiration and representation in the nation's founding document. It talks about a, a Makarata or a peacemaking or a settlement agreement-making um, mechanism. Mm. Um, and yet, it was rejected. We've gone back to another iteration. We're still a long yeah. way, I suspect, from putting it to a referendum. Is that the panacea? Is that something that is a game breaker that will deal with these issues of closing the gap, historical resentment, justice? Or, or are we asking too, too much of it, putting too much weight on it? What's the significance of it and what's the possibilities of its success? Uh, look, uh, looking for panaceas people in history have been doing that forever. Mm. There is no panacea. There, there are some very simple things and we, and we need to look at what is the, the growth of humanity in the last couple of hundred years and how have we built societies. People live longer, they live healthier, uh, they have more economic wealth than anything. If you go back to the mm. Middle Ages and you go back to, you go to any society, uh, everyone in our society has more wealth than anyone in history. Live longer, live healthier. Longer, do this. So what is the secret to that? And that's why I'm very much strong about economics and that because, you know, I look at books like, uh, uh, you know, Why Nations Fail. Mm. You've got a, a town on the United States-Mexican border as a, they're the same people, they're the same, they end up marriage, they do things. The American side, they're, they're, they're quite well off and the Mexican side, they're all poor. Mm. Why is that so? What is the secret about that? So that's what I look for. I, I see if you're really going to improve people's lives and really do things, then it is about that real self-determination of y yourself, of uh, 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 getting educated, Getting, getting jobs and careers, starting businesses. And this is one of the problems that we have in our remote communities. So we need to be building more uh, uh, businesses, commercial activity, and dare I say it, and I've been actually told that um, uh, you can't use this word, you know, having an Aboriginal business that makes profit. You know, like you make up. Well, how do you pay your bills if you're not making the? How do you employ people if you're not making? Profit? And and we know through the history how that's changed. So they're the ones I focus on. Uh, I see, you know, the voice to, par uh, to the parliament. And that I, I see that as a, as a different road. Uh, I see. Uh, I see that is about okay. We now that we've built the these Aboriginal nations, these groups. They should be the voices because they're the, under our own culture, uh, if, uh, only, the, only the, the, the traditional owners can speak for country mm. and they should be the ones who should be speaking for country. Uh, and then there's the, – but the, the real meat and butter stuff is – which is probably going to give you a heart attack uh, – is, uh, is education and economic development. Mm. And that's, that is the thing. And, and I'm proudly say, people ask me, this bloke outed me at a conference once. He said, what are you? And I said, it was a mate of mine, thank you. A, and I said, I know what he was talking about. And I said, yes, I'm a capitalist. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a supporter of the capitalist system because it has actually lifted more people out of poverty than anything else in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm.
On that note, we'll go, we have a roving microphone. There it is. If you want to put your hands up, we can take some questions for the next 10 minutes or so uh, that we have here today. Oh, there's one up in the corner here. Hi there. My name is Bruce Bland. I was very interested to hear your talk today. I've worked for about 20, the last 20 years in Outback as a volunteer in ICV, Indigenous Communities Volunteers, for 20 years. I've been in lots of projects in Outback communities. And you guys are the success of a system that has to continue. And we've got to stop all these gestures, which are big, flamboyant gestures, doesn't give anybody a job anywhere. You know, saying, saying you're sorry doesn't give anybody a job, doesn't give them an education, doesn't help them at all. It's symbolic. Most, my, I worked in Moree for a year in, in 1956 when Moree was the town, which you know it was then. It was a mission town. And then when I retired, I decided that I was one of the first volunteers ever in ICV. And I've been in 20 different projects all around Australia. And, the only, and I've written a long paper on it, how do we get here and how do we get out of here. The only way to bridge the gap is education. doesn't matter whether you're white, red, green or pink. Unless you've got employable skills, you can't get a job. And the problem with the Outback Ab Aboriginal communities is that they will never have an economy in them, so you can't have jobs out there. When you've got 100 people or 150 people, they can't, you can't get an economy that's sustainable. You've got to just do what your families did. They came to the city and they got a job. And I, I think that the way to get the education spread throughout the Indigenous community is to multiply by about 10 the number of scholarships that go to Indigenous students to come to good boarding schools in the city. And then they will get a, an example of other kids their same age who wash their hair, brush their teeth, and they're good examples. And they go to schools where everybody is doing the same thing. Aboriginals are got all, all got the same brains as all of us. They've just got to have the opportunity and you can't get it out in the, in the community. It's a, it's a really interesting point. I'll yeah. go to you, Warren, on, on this idea about remoteness because we know that all around the world, remoteness is poverty. Yes. And one of the reasons that China lifted 800 million people yeah. now out of poverty is because they urbanised and people moved. But there are difficulties with that in Australia because of Indigenous connection to country and yes. spiritual, spiritual connection, cultural connection. How do we bridge that? How do we allow for people to have mobility and connection? You do what you two did. That's mm. what you do, what you two did. Mm. What? So, yeah, I've been looking at this for a while you know, and I look at um, – uh, Australia, we you know you, you know you see, you see that famous photo of the of the, the Korean Peninsula where in, in the south the lights are on and in the north mm -hmm. there's in darkness. You, you could do the same thing in Australia. In the southeast, you, you you see all the lights on, in the southwest there's a few lights on, except they're turning off lately. <laughs> and then you see that there's white lights around the the coast, mm -hmm. and in the middle is nothing. Uh, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, uh, yes, urbanisation. The push for that is 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 true, um, and the, and you can't stop it. It'll, it just keeps on growing and growing. But what we can do is build other cities and other places. Now, for us, you know, it, it's sort of like um, you know, you look. Uh, everyone sort of lives in the southeast or the southwest in Australia, and our biggest neighbours live in the north. So we sort of like got our pants down, waving our bum in their face. It's uh, it's <laughs> we need to to really start developing our northern frontiers. You know, sort of like the old saying, "Go west, young man, will go north." The Americans did. So we need, uh, and there's some of these places are amazing places. And, and that's and that's what happened in our families. Yeah. The the biggest centres, the Dubbos, um, yes. the Woggers, yep. uh, you know, the Bathursts, they became centres for us to migrate to and work. That's right. It doesn't exist necessarily in a lot of those other parts of the there, country. Up, up north, there's yeah. not. And and yet there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of things to do things. I've I've I travelled Australia, and, and when I did my TV show, I was in re, uh, regional and remote Australia three days a week. And I can tell you there's not a place uh, that I went to that we couldn't kick a business off and we could do things. Mm. Uh, and then also with technology changes, uh, you know, like if you're an Aboriginal artist, say, in the middle of the De Simpson Desert, uh, with technology now you can actually sell to the world. In fact, I have a funny story about a friend of mine who, uh, yeah, this is about 20 years ago, decided to set up a website and he was doing didgeridoos and he put it up put these things up on the website and but 
people forget that when you're talking about the web, it never sleeps. Mm. And when he woke up in the morning, because people in the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere was looking at his website, he, he had 18,000 um, uh, orders for <laughs> did, didgeridoos. And uh, he said, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do things. You've got to, I, I'm always thinking outside the and square. And that's when you said, I can. Yeah, <laughs> I can. Yes, let's do it. So you're always thinking outside, you're always thinking about things. I'm one of these weird people, I walk into a town and I, and I listen to what's going on and I observe what's going on and then I think about it and then I talk about it. And, uh, I, and as I said, there's, um, you know, you, there is, if you're willing to have a go, take a risk and do things, you, can, you, you, you know, you can imagine. There's no stuff, thing stopping you. Look at Singapore. I, I, I just, as I just said, I was reading Lee Kuan Yew's memoirs. You know, they were the coolies of Asia. Mm. The, the Malaysians kicked them out, didn't mm. want anything to do with them. And they had nothing. They got this little tiny mm. swampy island and, and what have they done with it? Mm. Another mm. question? Mm. Yeah. Speaking about property rights and what an yeah. anchor that is on the advancement that you're talking about, please. Property rights work for me. I, I didn't quite explain myself but in, in regard to my father buying that house, my parents, I was buying the house in 1947. That made a difference. And, I, and, it, when you, and it also made a difference when my parents passed away when we moved to Sydney and that because we, we had a, a, build, a building up of assets and property rights are very important. I've I seen how some of these uh, community organisations operate. Uh, there was a bloke this is going back a few years, a young Aboriginal guy who did a, an apprenticeship in the mines, he's an electrician. He wanted to be, he'd go back to his community and be the electrician for that several communities, about five or six communities around. So with the housing and that, so he wanted, but because the, they had the CDC, CDP program there, they saw him as a competitor. And so they, they, he couldn't get a lease of any place. To do his business, so you went back to the mines. We've got to, we've got to be able to get. Uh, uh, and it, it raises questions about native title too, doesn't yes, it? Reform does. native title, where you can actually yeah. ma- well, use we, that in an economic way. Yeah, and we should be looking at, at people who can have those property rights. Now I know we've been discussing this from. Well, the CIS has been discussing this for nearly twenty years, isn't it? We've got to take that up. We've got to take that argument up because unless you don't have. Uh, unless you ha- have property rights, then it really s- struggles. And there's ways and means of doing that. It's just that we uh, that we've got that we've got a lot of people, a lot of blowback on that, and we've got to f- we've got to take up that fight again. There, yes. I gave you a job there. There, we uh, might <laughs> we might squeeze yeah. one more in if someone else has yeah. another. Yeah. I wasn't sure where you both ended up on constitutional recognition and the rules. Who mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that I'm not a, a great supporter of constitutional recognition within the constitutions. Um, I, I, I look at countries around the world and where you have race-based um, uh, sections of their constitutions. And, and really the 67 referendum was about how we got out of that mm. uh, and, and gave specific power to the federal government in regard to dealing with Aboriginal people. In it. You, uh, as I said, it's a different road and I suppose part of what I was saying was I'm more interested in education and economic development. I see them as the things that will lift people out of poverty, that will do more for people and, and, and growth and prosperity and also self-determination. You know, wouldn't it be great that we, you know, like um, Booker T. Washington, that he actually went out and got a university and, we, and he got that through business people. Why wouldn't it be good if we can do similar things, our schooling systems and stuff like that? That's true self-determination. You are making the determination of what you want to do for your kids into the future. Uh, I saw, I, I sit, sometimes I sit there and I, when I saw the model that they were talking about, to me, you know, you've probably seen my comment, as I said in the newspaper, was I see that as a different journey. It's about governance and issues there. But it's uh, it, but I, but if we talk about our culture, then let's talk about our culture. Our culture says that only people of, of that those owners, those traditional owners, can speak for country. So I can on Bunjalung land. I'm you know 
uh, might surprise pr- surprise you. I'm not the king, but I'm the man. <laughs> you know, I'm up there and I can speak for that country. I can't do that for Radri. Mm. Uh, I can't do that for other people's country. And that's why I said this model they're putting up is a huge bureaucracy, which is going to just soak up money. And, and, and so you've got local, regional, and then the federals, and you're going to have all these advisors and all these people. That to me, that's just doesn't, you know, they don't get the bang for the dollar. I'm more about the bang for the dollar, what, you know, and and uh, and how we do things. And I'll give an example. When I was chair of the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, we had 150 program streams to work through policies and that. We looked at it and within the first two months we collapsed it to five, five program streams. Just by doing that, we save $56 million in paperwork. Right, mm. so that fifty-six million dollars can go back into doing the health, educations and programs, rather than someone sitting in office doing paperwork. And that's what I—that's uh, what interests me about how we can do things better and make things up. I see how Aboriginal medical services can become, and some of them are doing it actually. Uh, the one at Griffin, for example, is where they're a Aboriginal medical service. They started out, but now they actually got a, a, a health service which anyone can come to, black, white, green or brit, brindle, they come there and it's, and it's like your uh, a medical, your health centre within the suburbs of Sydney. So, and that's because, and the, there's one in Brisbane, it, it was funny, it was an Aboriginal doctor who had a fight with the Aboriginal medical service there and so he went out and set up his own service and he's got about 52 people working for him now, so, <laughs> running as a business. Oh, look, you know, but, but my view on this is that, you know, I've, I've been a supporter of the Uluru Statement from the heart for – in the ability to create a mechanism for the communities that don't necessarily have the opportunities that we've had, um, to be, there is no doubt that policy is made specifically for one group of people in this country – and that's Aboriginal people. The government reserves the right to make that. And our ability to influence that policy at a governmental level is limited. And Warren's talked about the bureaucratic blockage and and representing the interests of a disparate community. It is very difficult. So as a mechanism for better governance and better outcome and better influence into policy, I could see that working. I don't – I'm. we're still waiting to see what the model is. It still has to go to a referendum and at the end of the day having a voice in the parliament is only going to be one part of the equation. It's the ability, Warren's parents, my parents, our grandparents to take that and work with that to create better outcomes. Having a voice in the parliament without that is not going to change anything. But as a mechanism for br- bringing about better mm. policy outcome, I can see it as a useful exercise, but we have to see the model and we have a long way to go in terms of getting that to a workable position to go to a referendum. And on that note, please, oh, join, me in thank- up. Oh, up up. please join me in thanking <laughs> Stan Grant and Warren Mundine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.